Right. Hi, my name is Michael Tete, and today I'll be presenting our paper titled um, Evolution of Complex Combinational Logic Circuits Using Grammatical Evolution with System Verilog. This work is done in collaboration with um, uh, Douglas Mota DS and Conor Ryan. We are all from the Biocomputing and Developmental Systems from the University of Limerick. Um, in this paper, we show how we um, address a hardware design um, problem using a software um, design approach. And we do so using grammatical evolution with um, System Verilog, which is a hardware description language used to design circuits in the industry. We also employ corner case testing, which is a well-known uh, testing technique in the industry, which, which, which helps us to significantly reduce the amount of testing that we do. So, um, so evolvable if if hardware is um, an evolutionary algorithm um, field, which has to deal with the design of digital circuits. Um, however, there are two main challenges um, that faces the field um, from evolving complex circuits, and these are scalability of representation and scalability of fitness evaluation. The problem is as the complexity of um, circuits increases, this, has, um, this means that longer chromosomes are required to represent this problem. And due to the destructive nature of um, genetic operators, this becomes very challenging for um, evolutionary algorithms. Um, similarly, increasing complexity also means that um, longer um, the fitness evaluations take um, longer for these circuits, and these make makes evolving complex circuits challenging for um, evolutionary algorithms. To date, the most complex accurate um, circuits evolved by um, evolutionary algorithms are 10 bit plus 10 bit adder, 6 bit by 6 bit multiplier, and a 19 bit parity circuit. Most of these circuits have been evolved at the base level, and that means they use primitive logic gates such as AND or NOT to design the circuits. However, in industry, due to the complexity of the circuits that have to be designed, designing circuits at these um, um, low level isn't ideal. And so they use what we call um, hardware description languages, which are similar to uh, programming languages that we use to design software. And this gives them the ability, the ability to focus on um, describing the behavior of these circuits as opposed to how um, logic gates connect to realize the functionality of the circuit. And the most popular choice uh, of HDL using in the industry are Verilog, System Verilog, and, and APHDL. And so this means that we can use grammatical evolution with um, hardware description language to design these circuits. Grammatical evolution is a genetic programming um, variant that involves um, programs in any back of normal form compliant uh, 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 language. So in this work, we show that we are capable of using grammatical evolution with hybrid description language to evolve um, 64 by 64 bit multiplier, 64 by 64 bit other and 128 bit selected parity circuit. Additionally, all these circuits are parameters, which means, which means that though we are evolving, say, a 64 by 64 bit multiplier, after an optimal solution is obtained, you can change the input size of these circuits without requiring a rerun of the evolutionary experiment. Additionally, we also show that um, appropriate selection of um, um, operators can significantly reduce the, the amount of simulation time of these circuits. We also use corner, case, corner cases, which helps us to significantly reduce the amount of test cases that we use in our test bench to test these circuits. So in response to the uh, challenges facing uh, evolve our hardware to design complex circuits, there have been several directions that have been taken to address these problems. The first is functional level evolution, where instead of using um, primitive logic gates such as AND, NOT, you instead use um, bigger building blocks like half adders, um, multiplexes, and two bit multipliers to design circuits. And results show that they do outperform gate level evolution and sometimes do so requiring a um, few number of generations. Other approaches have been to come up with decompositional methods that helps to decompose these complex problems, make, making them more evolvable for um, evolutionary algorithms to uh, tackle. Other directions have been to improve genetic operators and, and in doing so, increase evolvability. So for example, semantically oriented mutation operator ensures that whenever a mutation operation occurs, it results in the overall increase, it, it results in increase of the, in the overall fitness of the individual. Other approaches also um, implement multi-threaded implementations of evolutionary algorithms, specifically CGP in this case. This, uh, and this uh, ensures that there is better exploration of the search space. So in our work, we select three benchmark problems which are representative of the evolutionary circuit design uh, literature. The first is um, selective parity circuit. 
other handle multiplier. And all these three uh, principal problems are uh, parameterized. So for the experiment, we are using sensible initialization as our initialization technique. And each independent run um, uses 50 number of generations. Uh, our mutation rate is 0 0.01. We use a first rate of 0 0.8 and replacement rate of 0 0.5. And the number of run, the number of independent runs is 50. And we use a population size of 200 for the parity circuit and 1,000 for the other multiplier circuit. The reason for the difference in the population size is from our preliminary experiment, we realized um, the parity circuit was trivial to evolve. And so there was no need to use a um, bigger population size. We use lexical case parameter selection as our selection technique, which is, um, which is well known uh, to be very efficient on uh, program synthesis benchmarks. So for the parity grammar, we have two um, sets of grammars. And so this is the parity gamma A. And the code segment highlighted in um, blue is the start symbol. And here we are making use of a for loop, um, which helps us to iterate through the, the individual bits of the data as to the circuit. And then uh, as we do that, we evolve expressions that work on these individual bits in, in order to um, obtain a parity for the data. We are using a bitwise, we are using bitwise operators, which are uh, for the bitwise of, um, rule on code line nine. Now, the, here the begin module um, rule is simply the um, circuit interface for the, the circuit interface. So here it tells us the, the number of inputs coming into the circuit and the size of these inputs, as well as the output of the circuit. The code segment highlighted in yellow is, the, um, is how we make these module parameterized. So here we are using the keyword parameter with the name of the parameter and then with the default uh, parameter value. The second, uh, the second grammar version uses, um, similarly has the start symbol highlighted in blue. And here we make use of an always block. So an always block is um, similar to the way our loop works, but it's best triggered by a sensitivity list. What we mean by that is whenever any of these signals or their data changes, whatever um, code or operation is within the always block is executed. And here, instead of the for loop, we make use of reduction operators. And reduction operators take a single operand and apply the appropriate operation on the individual bits to obtain um, a result. And so it means that if we use only the reduction operation, um, and we don't, we don't necessarily need a for loop, but then we'd have a simple um, statement. And so we use that in conjunction with bitwise operators so we can have variable length um, expressions. And the interface is similar to that of, um, is the same as the parity grammar um, A. So for the other, similarly, we have the uh, star symbol highlighted in blue, and we're making use of the always block. And then we have the, here we are evolving the expression and um, that calculate the sum of the um, inputs that are coming into the circuit. So here, similarly, we have the uh, we have the code segment in yellow, which is the parameterization of the circuit, the number of inputs coming into the circuit, and then the output. Yeah, we have the, um, the grammar for the multiplier, and in a similar way, we have the star symbol here. We are making use of the always block. We are making use of the for loop, which helps us to iterate through the individual bits of the inputs. And we are making use of FLS constructs. And then we have the condition um, for the condition rule to help the, uh, the FLS construct. We also have the expression. So it is a non-recursive production rule. If we have a, um, a recursive production rule that helps us to have variable length uh, expressions. So here I'm making use of arithmetic and um, uh, shift and bitwise operators. And here we have the, um, the interface of the circuits and um, the number of inputs it takes. So we have the multiplier and the multiplicand and then the output, which is the products. Here we have two parameters, one specified for the inputs of the circuit and the other, which is the output of the circuit. Given the um, huge input sizes of these circuits, um, exhaustive testing isn't um, appropriate or isn't feasible. And so what we do is we employ corner case testing. And so corner cases are essentially extreme cases or unique cases which are within the range of the um, circuit input that have to be explicitly um, tested because they might they are likely to break the circuits if we do we do not do so. And so for 
the parity circuit with the default 128-bit uh, data length. The corner cases we identified were, um, if we give the circuit um, 128-bit representation of zero, she able to tell us if this, um, if, this if, if the circuit is supposed to behave as an odd parity circuit. She able to tell us if the uh, the data is um, odd or even uh, respectively. And then when we give it the maximum um, 128-bit um, number, which is uh, 128 ones, she able to tell us if it's an odd um, parity or even a parity depending on how how you want the circuit to behave. So in addition to these corner cases, we uniformly sample 20, 48. Um, other cases from the test vector, totaling a, 50, uh, a total number of 50 test cases. However, I recall that with um, the, the input size being 128, the max, it means the total number of testing, should we go for the exhaustive testing approach should be two raised to the power 128, which is huge. So using just 50 um, number of test cases, is a significant reduction. And this, and this is possible with the use of corner cases. So for the other, we use a similar approach. We said um, every other should be able to add two zeros. And um, every other should be able to multiply the maximum um, n bit um, number, two n bit numbers together, in this case, 64 bit. And then it should be able to add zero and any 64 bit number. So we identified three corner cases here. And in addition, we sampled 47, totaling the total of 50 test cases. We do a similar thing for the multiplier circuit. And every multiplier should be able to multiply zero and zero. Just multiply the maximum um, 64 um, bit numbers. We should also be able to multiply, multiply zero and any um, 64 bit number, as well as multiplying one and any 64 bit number. So, in addition to these four corner cases, we sample 46 uh, cases from the remaining test vector, totaling uh, a total number of 50 test cases. So because we also want these modules to be parameterized, we need to ensure that every optimal solution that we obtain um, uh, can, is properly parameterized. So what we do is after we obtain an optimal solution, we, we, uh, we re-instantiate that module using a different uh, input bit rate size. And so after we've gotten a 128 bit uh, optimal solution for the parity circuit, we change the parameter to 32 and then generate uh, test, case, test cases Use the same approach and test to see if it passes all the test cases. And we do the same for um, input bit size, which is greater than what we evolved. And so we use 102 for in this case, and we generate the test cases similarly. So we, we do we use a similar approach for all the um, you, all the other problems to test um, that all the optimal solutions are properly parameterized. So for the result for the um, Parity circuits, we have the parity gamma A figure one. We will call parity gamma A makes use of the for loop in addition uh, to the bitwise operators. And, and in figure two is part of the parity gamma B, which makes use of the reduction of bitwise operators. So we can observe from these two graphs with um, the mean best uh, across generations in red. And we realize that for both parameters, they attain maximum mean and uh, uh, best fitness right from the initial generation. However, the gamma B attains a um, lower mean average fitness from the initial generations as compared to that of um, gamma B. For the other, the similar, we have the mean best um, across generations in red and the mean average in black. And um, so we, we observe that the mean fitness um, starts from around um, 0 0.8 um, one from the initial generations. And then we have the mean average starting from around 0 0.1 from the initial generation. And the mean average uh, fitness uh, rises uh, rapidly after the, uh, during the initial generations. And that's of the main best um, uh, slowly, uh, increases slowly as the evolution progresses. And we also see the, uh, um, the error bars um, shortening as the evolution progresses. In, uh, um, indicating that there's less variability between the fitness values of these individuals. For the multiplier, we both the mean best and mean average fitnesses across generations um, increase uh, slowly, but we can, uh, as the uh, evolution progresses, but we can see that the fitness is increasing. We also observe that the, um, the error bars begin to widen as the 
ovulation progresses as well. And this indicates a um, high variability between the fitness values of um, these individuals. So we tabulated the um, success rate for these um, circuits, with the exception of the multiplier, which we obtained 36 out of 50 of tomorrow, and so we're able to obtain 50 out of 50 for the remaining problems. And so despite the, the, um, the multiplier having good um, successful runs, we're expecting the um, multiplier circuit uh, graph, the graph for the multiplier circuit to look more like the, the other graph in, in, the previous lab, uh, in the previous slide. And so what we did was to go back to look at those 14 um, um, solutions, which were not optimal, and test them again in order to, to, access, uh, to assess the test output of these circuits. And what we saw was that all these 14 um, um, unoptimal solutions had a fitness value of four. And if you recall, all those four um, um, cases were the current cases if we stated in our training and testing table. However, they were not able to pass the remaining 48 and um, 46 and um, uniformly sampled test cases. And this shows that um, if you had just uniformly sampled the test cases, um, we, could, we could have um, solutions which are not um, uh, really optimal solutions. And we see that corner cases um, do, do play an important role um, in testing. So here we record the, um, the average duration per run. And so the ones in bold are the, the ones we use for training. The default six, so for the 64 by 64, we had 18.14 um, average, 18.14 minutes average per run. And then for the multiplier, we had 55.28 minutes per, per run. And for the gamma A, the parity gamma A, we had 1056 um, minutes per average per run. And then for that of the gamma B, we had 0 0.99 minutes per run. So we can see here that the choice of the operators uh, does have an impact on the simulation time. And this is very significant in terms of uh, the difference. It takes about a minute. And this takes several hours to, um, to generate a parity for the circuit. In addition, we also wanted to find out if um, the, input bit, the input bit length has any effect on the simulation time. And so we conducted um, a different set of experiments, and this time using a less number of input, uh, input bit width sizes. So here we did 32 by 32 bit adder, and we had um, approximately 18 minutes. So there's a bit of a difference showing that, showing that as the input bit width sizes of input increases, there's an effect on the simulation time. And we did the same for the multiplier, uh, 32 by 32 bit multiplier, we had um, 48.91 minutes. And here we can see there's a bit of difference between the two. And this shows that as the bit rate increases, this is going to affect the simulation time. And that's right, because if you are doing multiplication, depend if the number of digits of your multiplier increases, you'll be performing um, more, uh, you'll be performing summation of more partial products. And so as your multiplier, and the number of digits your multiplier increases, there's more additions to be made. And so this will take a longer time. Also, the parity circuit, you see there's, a, there's an impact as the number of bits increases. And the same, however, for the parity gamma B, we didn't quite see a, a significant difference between the average time. Even though we increase, we reduce the, um, the bit rate size. So just to give an idea of how some of these solutions look like. So for the gamma A, we have uh, a, representative, a representative circuit uh, with a for loop here. And that, and that of the uh, gamma B, which uses the reduction and the optimized operators um, looking like that. So what we did was to synthesize these circuits using UOSS in order to know how many gates are required to uh, obtain bit level representations of these circuits. So both use 128 gates, and this shows the breakdown of the uh, respective gates that are used um, to uh, realize the same functionality. And we have that of the other here. Uh, lesson seven, which makes use of 350 gates, and then the breakdown of the, the respective gates that are used to realize the functionality of this circuit. But the multiplier, it requires 33.2k gates um, to represent the 64 by 64 bit multiplier. And this is the breakdown of the respective um, gates that are required to represent this circuit. 
So in conclusion, we obtain we have obtained 100% success rate for the parity other circuit and 72% success rate on the multiplier circuit properly. And these circuits are substantially uh, more complex than the current state of the art evolution approaches. And so here it's in case of the in terms of the other way, the one we've evolved here is 6.4 times and, and bigger. And for the multiply 10.7 times, and that's what the priority 6.7. And, and we are able to do so because of the availability of high level programming constraints such as FLs, for loops, the trice operators, shift, um, shift operators, and that's available in hardware description language, which helps us to rather focus on describing the behavior of circuits as opposed to how logic gates connect with each other to realize the circuit functionality. And we also show that appropriate selection of operators can be very important and can significantly reduce the simulation time of circuits. Now, this, these circuits are parameters, which means if later on you wanted, if you evolved a 64-bit um, multiplier, and in future you wanted a 32-bit, you do not have to rerun evolutionary experiment, as is the case in uh, most of the existing uh, algorithms used. You just have to modify the or change the parameters, and then you should go to um, function. So for future work, we need to um, evolve more complex, more complex circuit in order to assess the limitations of this approach. And so for also for circuits, that will require several lines of um, um, code to rip, um, um, which requires several lines of code. We need to find suitable decomposition methods that can help G to um, evolve such circuit. So we need to find out if the current decomposition methods are suitable. If not, we need to find one and that will be suitable for GE. And, and this should be a problem if we should we decompose problems because AGLs do support hierarchical modeling, which means that we can use other modules as functions in another module. So that shouldn't uh, be a problem at all. And so also in our approach, our current system is uses the conventional generator test, which means that we um, generate an individual and test. However, with modern processor, we should be able to uh, make use of the multi-core uh, processes to be testing a number of individuals at the time as we venture into, begin to venture into industrial scale and um, circuit evolution. These are, sec these are references and thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, yeah. Is there any question? I'm not seeing currently any question in the chat, uh, neither hands raise the hand. So I have a question, uh, just wait for other questions. Um, as far as I understand, uh, one strong point of uh, your approach is that you use an higher level, uh, higher level abstraction uh, for the representation. Is there any price to pay? So for example, I don't know, um, are there problems that with this approach cannot be uh, solved, taken or, or because of um, custom customization they require? Um, so one of the problems that we are that we are likely to face, as I said earlier, will be for circuits that require several lines of code um, to, to describe. That would be very challenging for um, um, G because you require longer chromosomes to represent. So we, we go back to having that same problem. However, here inputs inputs um, input sizes are not are not of uh, an issue because we have constructs like for loop to deal with. But the problem a problem which is likely to arise will be when you have several lines of code to represent a behavior, and so that's why we will need to find the compositional methods and to handle that. And it's, some complex circuits will also take um, longer simulation time, and that's why we need to. And, and designed systems that can be testing multiple individuals at a time, so we can uh, increase efficiency. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, we have another question from Bill about corner cases. Uh, yeah, um, sorry, I'm sort of monopolizing the questions, but you made the uh, point several times that you were getting efficiency by exploiting corner cases. And yep. the corner cases you've chosen for these problems seem very sensible. And I was just wondering if you had um, general ideas about 
how we would choose corner cases for other problems? Yes, yeah, so I think for the for these circuits, it wasn't very difficult to locate some of these um, corner case, cases, cases. But this might this might change for other circuit problems. Other circuit problems might be a bit um, difficult to um, to sort of look, find these corner cases. General problems other than circuit problems. Uh, I can't think of an example. Okay, okay. Top of my head, but it was just we we're, we're very interested in in testing software, and and so when you said you were using corner cases, my ears pricked up. So it's, we're looking at um, uh, how to test for software that whether it works correctly or not, and and um, yeah. it it seemed there might be some parallels. Yeah, yeah, I, I know they do use corner case testing in software as well, so. Um, I think a similar uh, procedure will be used to locate some of these um, corner cases for softwares. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for the question and Michael for the answer.